Good evening, everyone. I hope you're well and welcome to our webinar on hip and knee replacements. My name is Louise and I'm your host. Our expert presenters are Mr. Alex Chipperfield and Mr. Ol Matthew Oliver, our experienced consultant orthopaedic surgeons at Benden Hospital. The presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. If you'd like to ask a question during the presentation for later on, then you can use the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. You can do this with or without giving your name. If you'd like to book a initial consultation following this session, our private um, patient sales oh. will be available until 9 p.m. this evening. And we'll be able to provide you the phone number of her at the end of the session. Um, just to let you know, this webinar is being recorded. However, other attendees won't know you're taking part unless you choose to give your name during the Q&A session. I'll now hand over to Mr. Chipperfield and you'll hear from me again shortly. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming along this evening. Uh, welcome to our talk about hip and knee replacements. Uh, my name is Alex Chipperfield. I'm one of the orthopaedic surgeons here at Benenden. A uh, little bit of background. I uh, studied medicine at uh, Barts in London and qualified as a doctor in 1997. Uh, I trained around the southeast of England. And then in 2009, I went on a, a lower limb reconstruction fellowship in Sydney, Australia. Once I finished that, I came back to Kent and uh, took up a job as a consultant hip and knee surgeon in East Kent, where I've been for the last uh, 11 years. Uh, I've been a member of the Benenden Orthopaedic Consortium since we started providing a, a hip and knee replacement service here in 2012. Uh, to the right of your screen there, you'll see uh, this is my page from the National Joint Registry website. I appreciate the, um, the letters are a bit small, but what you can see on the pie chart there is that around half of my time I replace people's hips and half of my time replace people's knees. I perform about 150 hip replacements and 150 knee replacements per year. A little bit about Benenden Hospital itself. It was first opened in 1907 uh, as a sanatorium for postal workers. And if you uh, come along here, you'll see why uh, beautiful views and lots of fresh air around. Uh, the Benenden Healthcare Society was formed uh, around 50, sorry, 60 years ago, 70 now. Um, and then there was a major expansion in 2017. You can see a picture of the main entrance following the complete refurbishment of the hospital, which has left us with uh, big open airy spaces, state-of-the-art operating theatres and uh, very nice pleasant wards. Um, it's now a centre of excellence for orthopaedic surgery and we perform around 900 joint replacements here every year. Uh, brief background on hip and knee replacement surgery. These are figures from 2019. Obviously 2020 and this year have been slightly disrupted. Uh, hip and knee replacements are common. Around 100,000 of each are performed in the UK every year. Uh, generally, we tend to operate on slightly more women than men, and you tend to be approaching 70 years when you have your um, joint replacement. So I'm mainly going to focus on hip replacements today, and the way I've structured my talk is, you know, I could talk all day about hips, so what I'm going to do instead is uh, answer some of the fr most frequently asked questions uh, that I get when I see people in clinic about hip replacements. Uh, number one, the first commonest question I get asked is, do I need a hip replacement? And ultimately the answer to that is, well, well, you tell me. Um, a hip replacement, uh, hip arthritis causes pain. That's the number one reason to have a hip replacement. That pain is ten, tends to be uh, typically localized in the, in the front of the hip, in the groin, although it can radiate to the thigh and round the back into the buttock. Um, the pain can also travel down the leg and into the knee. And probably about once a month, I will see someone who exclusively has knee pain, who ends up uh, uh, with uh, hip pathology and needing a hip replacement. Um, now, pain, in order to have a hip replacement, this needs to be pain that you can't control by any other means. Uh, so uh, it's when painkillers either don't work or stop working or disagree with you, or when you've tried uh, stronger and stronger painkillers and injections and therapy, and despite all this, you're struggling with the pain. 
Um, alongside the pain, you can get other problems as well, commonly stiffness, and typically with an arthritic hip, what we talk about is, is difficulty getting down to tie your shoes and socks or, or cut your toenails, that can also be a struggle. Um, arthritic worn out hips can often give way as well, you, can, you no longer trust your hip, it feels unstable. Um, you, you, you tend to lose functions and that's quite, a, quite uh, easy to measure. So you can talk about how far people can walk before they have to stop uh, and also how often uh, your, your sleep can be disturbed because of pain when you roll over in bed at night. So all of these things together combine to talk about the quality of life and the choice as to whether or not you have a hip replacement really depends on the, 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 the effect that that worn out hip is having on your quality of life. Uh, next commonest question is, what is a hip replacement made of? Um, hip replacements are uh, made, generally made of four components. Um, it's, a, it's a ball and a socket joint, and there are two parts to each. This here is a, a socket. Um, so this has a, a metal semicircular back and then uh, a lining inside. That socket, you then have a, a, a ball here, and the ball sits on the um, metal stem. So you tend to have a metal stem and a metal socket, and the two click together to give you your moving hip replacement. Um, as I've said, the, the main components, the ball, uh, the, the, the stem and the shell are made of metal. The variability, the customization you tend to get in hip replacements is what you make the ball of and what you make the lining of. These two are, are pink. They are a ceramic uh, bearing surface, which is an incredibly hard wearing and long lasting surface. Uh, typically, we can use uh, ceramics or metals or plastics or any combination of those to tailor the right kind of performance hip replacement to, uh, to the patient in, in general. Um, the next thing people ask is, well, how are they fixed into, into the body? And that really depends on the, the, the quality of the bone that you're trying to implant uh, the hip replacement into. Uh, as I've said, we, we tend to perform most hip replacements on ladies who are approaching their 70s, and they can be people who uh, suffer with weakness of the bone or osteoporosis. So often, in order to enhance the fixation or reinforce the fixation of the implants into the bone, we use what's called a, a bone cement, which is an epoxy resin, which uh, acts as an interface between the, the, the bone and the metal. Uh, in younger, stronger people, uh, we tend not to use cement, we use an uncemented implant, um, which typically is coated with chemicals that allows the, the, the bone to actually grow into the implant itself and make it solid. Um, the lifespan of a hip replacement really depends on what you do with it uh, and, and how much force you put through it. But a, a modern hip replacement using modern materials and put in properly uh, will last you for decades. Next question uh, tends to be, well, well, how long will I be in hospital for? Um, your hospital journey is, is made up of several different steps. Uh, typically, your, your, the first part of your journey will be an outpatient appointment. So you will be referred up to Benenden Hospital via your GP and you'll meet myself or someone like me to, uh, to, to talk about your, your, your problems in more detail. Uh, from that consultation, we'll be able to take a history and look at your medical problems. We'll also get a chance to examine your hip and uh, the, the muscles and, and legs around it and see how everything's working. We'll also be able to investigate you with x-rays and scans. With that picture, looking, putting all those components together, we can come to a decision as to whether or not a hip replacement is the right thing for you. Um, if we decide to proceed with surgery, you'll then have another outpatient appointment uh, later on, and that's called a pre-assessment appointment. In that appointment, you'll discuss the anaesthetic with the anaesthetist, and you'll see the, the nurses and the physios and the therapists who will go through everything in great detail about what happens before, during and after your operation. The hospital stay, well, you'll get admitted to the hospital on the, on the day of the surgery. Um, the operation itself will, will take place later on that day. And depending on the time of the operation, we try to get you up and about fully weight bearing on the day of the operation. 
If you're walking on your new hip or new knee on, on day zero, then that fills you with confidence uh, for the next day that everything is strong and solid and, and we, we get you up and, and get you going very quickly. Um, we, we send you home when it's safe to do so. Now, safety means lots of different things to different people. Uh, from my perspective, I need to make sure that you're medically fit. I need to make sure that I've seen your x-rays and I'm pleased with them, that your blood tests are okay and that your wound looks okay. Uh, from a therapist's point of view and from a nursing point of view, we need to be sure that your pain is under control and that your general mobility is to such a level that you're able to cope and look after yourself once you leave the hospital environment. The length of stay in hospital is surprisingly brief. Uh, typically, my patients following a hip replacement will go home uh, two days later. Um, sometimes you stay an extra night, but it tends to be two nights in hospital. Hip replacement surgery, we put some precautions on you in the early stages, um, a list of do's and don'ts while, while everything is knitting together and healing up, and those precautions tend to last for around six weeks. Leading on from that, the next questions I get asked are, when can I, when can I do such and such? Here I've got the, the, the top eight things that people ask, when can they do it? It's not in any particular order of um, popularity, by the way. Um, so I'll just go through these here. So when can you walk? Well, we've already said, it, as, as long as your legs are awake from the anaesthetic, you'll be walking on the day of the surgery. I think that's very important. Driving, uh, driving, there's no hard and fast rules as to when you can drive following a hip replacement. There are basically though three elements to it. Firstly, you need to be able to uh, drive a car without being under the influence of any mind altering drugs. So strong painkillers, that kind of thing. Obviously you can't mix that with driving. Uh, the second thing is that you need to be able to get in and out of the car safely. Uh, so squeezing yourself into a two-seater sports car may take you longer than climbing into a normal SUV. Uh, the third thing is that you need to be able to control the vehicle when you're in it. And that depends on which leg you've had operated. If you've had your right hip replaced, well, that's the one that you need to, uh, to apply the brakes and to drive the car. So you shouldn't be driving until you can safely stamp on the brakes and perform an emergency stop. With your left leg, if you have an automatic car, then that left leg won't be doing very much at all. Uh, get, uh, so really that's when, you, as long as you can sit in the car safely, then you can drive. Typically, it tends to be between somewhere between four and eight weeks when people get behind, back behind the wheel, uh, but that varies from person to person. Uh, riding a bike with a hip replacement, uh, uh, I, I replace a lot of cyclist hips. And uh, I see no reason why people can't get back cycling afterwards. Um, it's not the movement of cycling that concerns me. It's the, the potential for causing damage if you fall off in the early stages, if you're not quite as confident on your bike. So what I tend to suggest is that if you have a, a, a stationary bike or an indoor bike, then you can get back onto that within around three or four weeks following the operation. Uh, outside, uh, providing the weather is good, I tend to be a little bit more cautious and say around two to three months before you can do that. Skiing, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of patients that like to get back to skiing following a hip replacement. Again, I have no objections to skiing. It's falling over that's the problem. Uh, so again, you need, to be, you need to be confident and you need to have your, the, the strength and musculature around it to, to be able to support yourself properly. Generally, I tell people to, to skip a season and then ski the next year. Uh, playing golf. Uh, golfing in itself is an occupation that lots of, lots of people who have joined replacement age do, uh, and people get back to it very quickly. Um, generally, what I tend to say is around about six weeks before you start on a practice green, uh, hitting a few uh, uh, putts or, or on the, onto the driving range. If you are going to be playing, maybe start on a par three course or nine holes. Uh, the walking distance can get you more than the actual golf itself. So I do suggest maybe using a buggy for the first few times that you're back playing golf. Um, sex, sex again, um, really depends on the, the position that you, that you 
choose. Uh, generally, I advise to uh, play it safe and play it safe and uh, not put yourself in any awkward positions uh, that could put extra stress through your hip. And generally, it's something to be avoided for the first six weeks following surgery. Uh, traveling. Lots of people travel uh, many miles to Benenden to have their surgery. And so there's nothing wrong with getting in a car at two or three days to drive home, uh, to be driven home again. We do suggest that you take a break every hour or so to stretch your legs and have a cup of coffee or tea, uh, but certainly uh, unlimited driving uh, as a passenger, as long as you're sensible. Most people uh, ask, tend to ask more about air travel. Um, hopefully one day we'll be able to get back to that. Uh, the way things are at the moment, the, the real risk with air travel is a risk of uh, developing blood clots. Uh, blood clots are a risk that are present following surgery, and the risk is higher the closer to the operation that you are. So what we tend to recommend is that you don't travel by air for the first six weeks following a joint replacement. Um, between six weeks and three months, we suggest that you stick to short haul flights, so uh, four hours or less only. And on those flights, make sure that you are well hydrated not with alcohol, unfortunately, and that you get up and walk around every every hour or so in the cabin. Uh, long haul flights, so four hours or more, I recommend three months before you do that. Uh, getting back to work, um, re recovering from a major operation like a joint replacement is something that you need time to do, and you need to be able to go at your own pace to do it. What you don't want to be is be under pressure from a work environment to get back if you, if you try and force yourself back too soon, you may run into trouble. So I recommend that from the outset, you tell work that you're not gonna be there for three months. If by two, two and a half months, you're feeling that you're good to go and, and happy to get back sooner, then that's always a nice surprise for work rather than it being the other way around and you feeling that you're too much, uh, being put under too much pressure. Uh, what could go wrong? There's a, there's a, again, I could talk all day about the, what could possibly happen during a hip replacement. Uh, there are risks associated with uh, any kind of surgery like this. And these risks are rare, but they are real and sometimes they can be serious. Planned hip replacement or knee replacement surgery in an environment like Benenden is an extremely safe thing to go through. Um, and we do everything that we can to mitigate any risks. If people do develop problems, then we do our best to, to make things right as, as, as quickly as possible. But in real life, sometimes bad things happen. So the kind of things that can happen with uh, in, in a hip replacement is you could lose blood, needing a, a blood transfusion. That's quite rare these days. About one in 50 people might need a blood transfusion. Blood clots, I've already mentioned blood clots in relation to air travel, and the, there's a significant risk of developing a, a blood clot either in your leg or in your lungs. And everything that we do in the perioperative period really is tailored to minimizing the risk of blood clots. Um, any wound can get infected, and infection, again, is something that terrifies orthopedic surgeons. And we do everything that we can. Uh, you see, there's a picture of me uh, operating there, performing a hip replacement, wearing a spacesuit on, and that is for your protection rather than mine, uh, to ensure that everything is as clean and sterile as possible when you're having the surgery. Hip replacements can dislocate, they can pop out of joint. That's a particular risk in the early stages following a hip replacement, and that's why there are certain precautions that I mentioned before that we like, like you to um, just take things easy for the first six weeks or so while the, the, the soft tissues and muscles are settling down around the hip. Um, having a joint replacement surgery like this uh, can alter your leg length. Um, Again, with a, with a planned operation that's properly thought out and properly performed, this is a, a generally, this is a, a low risk, but it can help happen. Um, you can have broken bones and you can have damage to nerves and blood vessels um, as well. The other risk with a hip replacement is that an artificial joint can eventually wear out or work its way loose uh, towards the end of its life. And that may require further surgery later down the line. All in all though, despite all those bad things, um, hip replacements, joint replacements in general, are fantastic operations that have a, a huge benefit on your quality of life. 
Uh, this is a slide that I stole from uh, a, a colleague of mine. They're looking at the, the, the top 10 interventions that you can have that have the biggest, longest lasting difference to your quality of life. And right at the top, the biggest part of that, that nice big blue chunk there is reconstructive orthopedic surgery, hip and knee replacement, genuinely life-changing operation and overwhelmingly in a good way. Um, if you're undecided about whether or not to still proceed with uh, hip replacement or knee replacement, then I recommend that you look at this website. This is jointcalc.chef.ac.uk. Sorry, it's not a bit of a mouthful. Uh, this is a website that is produced by the National Joint Registry. Uh, this allows you to, if you log on to this website and you enter your individual details. So all about your symptoms, uh, your general medical health and the surgery that you're thinking about having done. And this will tailor and quantify the risks and benefits of that procedure for you. And it's a very, patients have told me, it's a very useful tool. You get, a, you get a visual idea of how much better you will be following your surgery and a real uh, idea of the potential risks and benefits. Obviously, I can only really talk in general terms about these things, but this will give you a very clear idea, personalized to you. And I recommend taking a look at that if you're thinking about uh, a joint replacement operation. Um, right, I think that's that's enough of me for the time being. Um, now I'm gonna hand you over to my colleague, Matt Oliver, who's gonna to talk to you about knee replacements. And then I will see you back at the end for the Q&A session. Am I live now, guys? Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Alex, for that excellent talk. And thank you for Benenden for inviting us to uh, perform this webinar for everyone. I'm going to talk about total knee replacements and osteoarthritis of the knee. So without any further ado, next slide, please, Alex. So a little bit about myself. Um, I qualified from St George's Hospital Medical School in 1998 and completed all my uh, surgical uh, exams by 2009. And then like Alex, I went abroad to the University of Calgary in 2009 for a year long adult joint reconstruction fellowship. Uh, then on, on my return, I was appointed to East Kent hospitals as a NHS consultant with a primary interest in hip and knee surgery. Next slide, please, Alex. So uh, my talk has four parts to it. I'm gonna set the scene, giving you some facts and figures about knee replacements, osteoarthritis of the knee. I'm going to talk to you about the referral process and then a little bit more detail about the different treatment options available. And finally, I'll wrap things up with a conclusion or two. So next slide, please. So the National Joint Registry, this was uh, set up in 2003. Initially, it was a voluntary organization that uh, just uh, included the independent sector. Uh, and uh, the National Joint Registry of England, Wales and Northern Ireland started out by recording all of the detail for hip and knee replacements initially. Uh, so the patient's details would be anonymized and the, the information collected would include their age at surgery, their anesthetic status, uh, the implant that they received, uh, when, at what hospital and who did it. Uh, it's got expanded significantly since its early days. And in 2014, I think it was, it became mandatory for all hospitals in England, Wales and Northern Ireland to include the data of hip and knee replacements. Yeah, and they expect a compliance of about 95%. This makes it an extremely powerful tool for um, health assurance uh, uh, purposes to make sure that the implants used, the surgeons that do the operation are satisfactorily performing and also that uh, a tally can be uh, collected as to uh, what volume is done where in the country. So it's good for health economic planning as well. Scotland has its own individual register. It's been expanded to also include ankles now, shoulder replacements and elbow replacements. So to give you a few figures about knee replacements, up until the 31st of December 2019, uh, between 17 and that date, uh, about a quarter of a million knee replacements were carried out in the National Joint Registry, and 100,000 of those were carried out in the year 2019. 
the average age of surgery requiring a knee replacement is 69 across the board and it's declining year on year. Uh, obesity, which is a, a very important uh, factor with knee replacement surgery, is also increasing year on year. As Alex mentioned, there's a female preponderance for the requirement of knee replacements with 56% of all patients being of the female sex. And the overarching cause for needing a knee replacement is osteoarthritis with 98% of those operations logged into the uh, NJR stating that as the primary pathology. With regard to volumes, uh, interestingly, in the latest report from the NJR, uh, the median number of knee, total knee replacements performed per year per surgeon is 40. And the unicompartmental or partial knee replacement, the median number performed per year is just seven. And when you think there are 1.3 million total knee replacements stored in the National Joint Registry since its inception with a long-term follow-up of 16 and three quarter years, those two figures I've just mentioned don't seem to be too much, too many. Uh, so the, there's a, a vast spectrum of um, uh, across the board with surgeons that just do hip replacements and do high volumes, surgeons who just do knee replacements and do high volumes, or those who have a balanced practice like Mr. Chipper Field and I, who have a, a practice of about 50-50. And then there are also the occasional surgeon that does the hip or knee replacement. The most important point though using the NJR is that it now is the largest data set of knee replacements in the world. And it's a great research tool to see how different implants are performing and also to highlight if there are any issues with survivorship. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. Next slide, please. So osteoarthritis, it's the most common joint disease and the knee is the most commonly affected of these joints. And it's estimated at any given time about 8 million people are affected in the UK with osteoarthritis. It's a degenerative condition. At present, there is no cure. These two x-rays show the degeneration and the hip and the knee. Next slide, please. The main risk factors for developing osteoarthritis of the knee are as follows, with the number one being obesity. If you are significantly overweight with a body mass index of over 40, which puts you in the morbid obese range, then studies have shown that you are 40 times more likely to require a knee replacement in your lifetime than someone with a BMI in the normal range. Another risk factor is being over 50 years of age, having had a previous knee injury, such as an ACL rupture or a significant meniscal injury, or a chondral defect where the articular cartilage is damaged or previous fractures of the knee joint all can precipitate osteoarthritis. Uh, being female slightly increases the risk and there is a weak genetic link also. Next slide, please. The main symptoms and signs, essentially pain is the overarching one. Uh, with pain, you also have stiffness, and with stiffness, it leads to reduced function. And some patients also experience crunchy, creaky knees, especially on going up and down the stairs. Next slide, please. So the primary care management, this is GP land, they, they try their best to manage the situation with lifestyle advice about weight loss, activity modification. They give advice about analgesia. They refer you to physio. And some GPs that have uh, an interest in orthopedics will provide a steroid injection service that keeps the pain at bay temporarily. They do also follow loose, nice guidance. Um, and the next slide will explain that. Next slide, please, Alex. And once you've tried all those things for about three months, if you're going nowhere, then it's advised to be referred back into secondary care. Uh, in recent years, there's been another hurdle to jump over when, when the patient has uh, got to go through the musculoskeletal triaging service first, where they see an experienced or an advanced physiotherapy practitioner uh, and have more physiotherapy, more advice, more painkillers and so on. Next slide, please. That can be potentially avoided uh, by using Benenden Hospital. And there are four ways to get to see us at Benenden. Uh, Self-pay, 
through your membership or using your private medical insurance and all insurers are recognised, all main insurers are recognised. The fourth way is through the NHS e-referral system at the discretion of your GP if the waiting time in your local area is excessive and this is nearly always the case. Um, when you come to Benenden, when we do our best to try and see you within two to three weeks of receiving the referral, you'll go to a dedicated hip and knee surgeon and have a detailed clinical assessment, which, has, uh, which we've already alluded to includes history, examination and the relevant investigations. You will then be invited to be part of the shared uh, decision making process to tailor make uh, the, the treatment plan suited to what you need at that time. And that may be continued help with non-operative measures, uh, or it may be indeed that the time has come to consider surgery such as a total knee replacement. Uh, for hip and knee replacements, Benenden has been an advocate of uh, the rapid recovery protocol now for several years. And I think this is very important to emphasize. If for those who haven't heard of that before, that is a multidisciplinary approach between all of the main stakeholders in the care pathway. That includes the anaesthetist, the physiotherapist, the surgeon, the nurses on the ward, uh, and outpatient physios as well. And it's all about optimizing the patient's journey, minimizing the pain and helping you recover as quickly as possible. And Benenden Hospital does this very well in my opinion. Next slide, please. So a total knee replacement, essentially uh, it has been deemed to be a highly clinically effective and cost-effective initiative. But the timing of when you have surgery with one of these is absolutely crucial. Uh, you should have at least uh, evidence of exposed bone on bone uh, in, a, in at least one knee compartment, and some would say in at least two. We only wish to really take you to the next step when all conservative measures have been exhausted. And even then, there's still more work to be done, and it's best to try and have a, a good bash at pre, pre op preoperative optimization. So, making sure your diabetes is sorted trying to lose weight, getting a bit fitter. And the concept is called prehabilitation and that, that will help you through the journey of recovery. Unfortunately, uh, especially as I found out in my time in Canada, it's becoming much more of a lifestyle choice, but it's not simply like changing a tire on a car. It's a big procedure and it's not to be taken uh, lightly. Next slide, please. This is because the revision rates at 15 years are quite significant if you have your knee replaced early in life. Sometimes you have to, there's no doubt about it. Life is just too painful. You've had a significant knee injury and you, you need to get on, carry on working. But it's important to understand that if, if you do have your knee replaced early in life, then there's a very high chance that you may need to have it revised potentially at least once. And an interesting fact from the latest report of the NJR that I've read is that uh, they've now uh, firmed up the calculation about when is the right age to have a knee replacement. Of course, there are many other factors involved, but they say that if you have your knee replaced from 70 plus, uh, that is the ideal time because it's unlikely for the vast majority of that age group that they'll need to worry about a knee revision, everything being equal, everything going to plan. Next slide, please. So a partial knee replacement, this is also offered here at Bellenden Hospital. There are a few of us that have a very specialist interest in this and good outcomes are achievable. However, survival is lower in most uh, orthopedic studies. So patient selection and surgical technique is key and I'd recommend that you see a surgeon that does a high volume of these. This is uh, endorsed by the British Association of Knee Surgery and the British Orthopaedic Association. The surgeon that you should see should be doing at least probably between 10 to 20 cases per year. Next slide, please. Again, the most uh, popular one uh, that has uh, the most uh, sort of um, usage in the NJR is the Oxford knee replacement. But again, as you see here, the revision rates are quite high compared to a total knee replacement. You know, one in five at 15 years is potentially going to need to be revised. 
that said that the NJR is indicating that the uncemented Oxford knee, which has been around for a shorter period of time, is having some impressive results with a much lower revision rate at six years, at uh, 10 years. Next slide, please. The high tibial osteotomy was quite popular in the 70s and 80s and then sort of calmed down and then has risen again in recent years in, uh, in vogue or popularity. But it has a high failure rate and patient selection is critical usually left to the younger individual to try and offload the weight bearing part of the knee by changing its anatomy. It is technically demanding, it requires a lot of time off work. And as far as I'm aware, there's no published cost effectiveness data to uh, say that it's a worthwhile intervention if you have established arthritis like the x-ray shows on the, on the screen here. Next slide, please. Arthroscopy of the knee, still a very common procedure. Um, I've noticed in recent years that there has been a decrease in uh, the use of arthroscopy in the knee for an arthritic knee. And this is endorsed by several high profile studies that have been published in important orthopedic journals. It basically says that it's a sham procedure just to wash out the knee. You really need to have a definite pathology such as a loose body in the knee making the knee lock or a significant meniscal tear on the background of osteoarthritis that has changed the usual pattern of pain. Then I think an arthroscopy in the presence of arthritis is still worthwhile. Next slide please. So post-operative care after total knee replacement at Benenden. We will be seen uh, by the physiotherapist twice daily on the ward and you'll go through a graduated uh, exercise program with them starting with exercises on the bed and progressing to standing and fully weight bearing on the knee hopefully on the day of surgery using a frame and then progressing to crutches uh, and finally you'll be shown how to safely go up and down the stairs using uh, crutches and the average length of stay is usually about two days after a total knee replacement. At six weeks, you'll come back to the hospital and see one of the orthopaedic surgeons. And to, for me, this is a crucial appointment because I need to make sure that the wound has healed, that the uh, range of motion in the knee has got to at least 90 degrees and that the patient is progressing. There will be a few backward steps, but on the whole, they're on the upward trajectory and improving. And I personally think that all patients should receive at least six sessions of uh, targeted physiotherapy in the early post-operative period. Um, those who live locally can utilise the Benenden team uh, post-operatively. Uh, and if there are any issues, I certainly would recommend uh, self-funding some physiotherapy because it really does put the icing on the cake and make your knee replacement an excellent one. Next slide, please. That brings me on to the patient reported outcome measures. These are quite topical at the moment. Uh, hip and knee replacements are, are included in these. And for those who haven't heard of them before, essentially functional outcome measures uh, and quality of life scores are taken from the patient preoperatively and then repeated again six months postoperatively and then compared and clever people do some statistics and work out whether the intervention that has happened to you has benefited you. Uh, in summary, with regard to knee replacements, greater than 80% of people have stated that they've had excellent, very good or good satisfaction with their surgery. This is at the six month mark. And I personally think it should be repeated again at the 12 month mark because some knee replacements can take a little longer to bed in and recover from. That said, it's still been judged to be a very cost-effective intervention for the healthcare economy as a whole. And as Mr. Chipperfield alluded to, it's on the in, uh, number one in the uh, quality of life rankings on that uh, pyramid that we showed earlier. Next slide, please. Dissatisfaction rates need a brief mention. This really does um, come down to getting the timing right and the age of the patient. If the patient has uh, their knee replaced uh, too soon, if there's not enough wear and tear, then some of the studies have shown a dissatisfaction rate of up to 20%. And these are usually in the age group of 50 to 65. 
And I think the key to uh, reducing this dissatisfaction rate is to spend quality time with the patient in managing their expectations to make sure that they're aware of how long the recovery is going to be and what limitations a knee replacement will have upon their life. Its prime purpose is for pain relief and function, you know, walking from A to B. You're not going to really be able to play competitive sport like football. You can ski with, if you wish to, but there's the risk of having a fall. You can kneel on a knee replacement if you wish to, but it's frowned upon because it can damage the patella. Uh, you can ride a bike, you can play golf, you can do most things. Uh, but it's important to have a, a really good heart to heart with the patient to ensure that their expectations are managed. Next slide, please. So what makes a great knee replacement? Next slide, please. There are three factors, really. The, the patient factors, and this includes managing expectations for patients with resilience, uh, their dedication to post-operative rehabilitation despite being in pain. There are surgical factors. You want to come to a unit with excellent infect low infection rates that uh, practice enhanced recovery protocols that have a very good physiotherapy set up and have uh, orthopedic surgeons that perform this operation in, in high volume, such as at Benenden Hospital. It's a team affair, really, and um, if each one of those uh, stars align, so to speak, then a, a surgical result, uh, a good surgical result usually is the case. Next slide, please. These are just a few extra pictures that I put in to show some of the deformities that um, come to our attention in the clinic. This x-ray here shows a, a bow legged knee or various osteoarthritis knee. And every time this chap takes a step forward, the knee collapses outwards and makes him unstable. And it's very unpainful, very, very painful. Next slide, please. To try and correct that, uh, bow leggedness, uh, the knee replacement straightens the mechanical alignment again. Next slide, please. And here are a few scanogram pictures of that. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Then here's a, a quick case study. There's two osteoarthritic knees. Uh, the left knee in particular is very wobbly, unstable, and a lot of pain in the medial part of the knee and uh, and the anterior or front part of the knee. Next slide, please. This is uh, the, the most commonly used knee replacement here, or the prime knee replacement used here at Benenden Hospital is the Zimmer Biomet Vanguard knee. Uh, and there's the post-operative x-ray. Next slide, please. I will mention about some post-operative problems that are very important to highlight. These are things that the orthopedic surgeon needs to know about. And we are wary of the fact that our patients come from afar and we can't always get access to them or them to us like we could if you live down the road. But we need to know if you have persistent wound discharge. Uh, this is very important because it is salvageable if we know about it early. If it is left to fester and the uh, infection develop, then sometimes uh, the infection can go deep and put the uh, implant's longevity at risk. The other thing to look out for is the deep vein thrombosis. The chances of that happening are minimal uh, because of, um, as Alex alluded to, we take all the precautions we can using blood thinners and so on and so forth and getting you up mobile quite quickly. Next. Uh, slide, please. Some reasons for revision. Uh, a knee replacement, if everything goes to plan, should last 15 to 20 years, all being well, but they do eventually become loose. Um, and in the NJR, 39% of them are revised for this reason. The polyethylene bearing be can become uh, worn as well, leading to instability. You can have a, a significant increase in pain uh, if these uh, issues happen, but to have your knee revised for unexplained pain is usually futile and should be avoided. Sometimes um, mistakes are made, very rarely, and the implants can be malaligned, and sometimes infection can be, become deep and unable to be eradicated by wound debridement and antibiotics. Next slide, please. 
Uh, finally, just talking about the modern technologies, computer navigated new placements aren't really modern anymore. They came about in the sort of uh, early 2000s. And the whole idea about them was to try and reduce the outliers, to reduce human error in um, the surgical cuts made and the alignment of the implants. Uh, it does do that, but medium term studies up to about 10 years or so haven't really shown any significant uh, advantages as far as I'm aware when compared to standard conventional techniques. Next slide, please. That also is the same for patient specific knee replacements where the patient has a preoperative MRI scan done to help design the implants and customize the implants and the cuts on the bone to the individual. I've done over 200 of these knee replacements and anecdotally I do see that the patients recover quicker and have less pain but studies seem to suggest uh, in the medium term there is no real clinical advantage when compared to, to conventional techniques. Uh, robot assisted total knee replacements gathering momentum, quite an exciting um, thing to, uh, to get involved with. Uh, at the current, in the current climate with the huge surgical waiting list caused by COVID-19, I think it will be something that uh, uh, will be difficult to argue uh, in the health economy because it takes time to build up your learning curve and to do these operations and uh, it probably isn't a practical solution to a long waiting list. Next slide, please. So to conclude, osteoarthritis of the knee is incurable at this time, uh, but they're working hard to try and uh, regenerate cartilage using stem cells, etc. If you don't wish to have an osteoarthritic knee, you really should look after your body weight because uh, that's the prime risk factor for developing it. Appropriate referral into secondary care is key and it should only really occur when you've exhausted all conservative efforts uh, and patient selection, timing of surgery and management of expectations with the patient is key to getting a good result. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much, guys. That's really interesting. Um, we had some questions that have been posted already. So, um, and if you do have any other questions, please um, do submit them. Um, our first question is from Jeff, and he says, does having the leg in a brace after knee replacement have an effect on recovery? Uh, in a brace, uh, usually you wouldn't need to have a brace after having a total knee replacement. It would be bandaged up uh, with a woolen crepe the night uh, of the operation, and then we would leave it free uh, and expect you to do the range of motion exercises. Um, I haven't used a brace after knee replacement, I don't think, ever. I don't know about you, Alex. No, not at all. Um, it's, 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 not, it's not something that we generally do. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Next question is from Maria. She says, if I am suffering from regular intense deep knee pain, cannot sleep well, have had um, have had a hip replacement on the same leg in 2016, can I consider a knee op or investigation? Um, she also suffers from osteoarthritis and is worried that she might have less mobility if she does have the knee replacement. And can you advise? Absolutely. I mean, it sounds like uh, she's someone who's in trouble, who's struggling. Um, she knows the size of the operation involved, having been through something similar with the hip. And it sounds like she's the ideal person to come along and say hello to us and we can take a look at her and her knee and see if her knee replacement is the right thing to do. But yeah. Hmm, great. Thank you. OK, this is um, next question is from an anonymous person. They say, if I live a long way from the hospital, how is aftercare arranged and would I have to travel to the hospital for physio or follow up appointments? Um, if you're a member of Benenden, you can utilise the membership services to arrange physiotherapy in your locality post-operatively, and that sometimes does occur for those who live a long distance away. Uh, when you come back for the checkup at six weeks, uh, the, the physiotherapy team here sometimes uh, arrange for you to be seen on the same day with them as you would be seen by us, so you have a, a double appointment. I think that works out quite well, actually. 
but it is key to get good quality physiotherapy after a hip or knee replacement. And if you live in the north or in, in Cornwall and you come to see us, then I would probably recommend arranging physiotherapy in your locality afterwards. Right, thank you. One thing that we have noticed um, in the last 18 months is the advent of telemedicine. And uh, I'm, we've been doing it for years at Brendan because we are a long way from lots of people. Uh, but you know, for routine follow-up and aftercare, we're very happy to do it either by video consultation or by telephone. The one thing that I would echo Matt there is that I would recommend that, that you see a local physiotherapist that's the important hands-on uh, post-operative care that you will need. And traveling to Benenden for that, although you're very welcome to, wouldn't be the best use of your time. So I would recommend local follow-up of physiotherapy. The other deal that I make with my patients is if they come from a long way away, if they say anything during the remote consultation that has me even in the slightest concern, then they have to come up and see me. It's that simple. Um, we, we need to know about problems if there are any, and most of the time, although we can reassure people remotely, it's always best to see them face to face. Yeah, well, I agree with that. Great. Um, we have a question around carrying out knee or hip surgery on a 43 year old. Um, they appreciate they possibly need another one in their lifetime. Um, and would, would you do that? Uh, yeah. Yes. Is the answer? Um, there's. I, I don't put an age limit on on when when you're, you you don't wait till you're old enough to have an operation. Um, it's all about when the timing is right for you. It's about the quality of the life that you're living, and whether or not you've exhausted all other possibilities. Um, both myself and Matt, we we although the average age for joint replacement surgery is in, is uh, 69, 70, we've operated on people in their 20s and in their hundreds and everywhere in between. Um, as long as you're aware of the potential for needing further surgery in, in your lifetime, and also as long as you're aware of the limitations of an artificial joint, you know, a lot of 30 or 40 year olds when they have their knees replaced, they, they you know, the, the demands that they're going to put on those knees are much higher than your average 70 year old. And sometimes they may end up disappointed at the, the level of function they reach. But yeah, no, absolutely. If, you're, if you need it doing, it's not about age, it's about when the time is right. I would just like to second that and also add that the patient themselves, in my experience, has a light bulb moment. They just know that there's nothing else that can be done and they're miserable and they're fed up with feeling miserable. They're struggling at work. They're not enjoying playing with their kids in the garden. They can't keep up on a walk around the block with the wife or the, the husband. And uh, it, that to me uh, is very important. And it means that, uh, you know, if they have tried everything that we've just mentioned, the knee replacement should very much improve their quality of life. Yeah, excellent, thank you. Um, are you able to play squash after a hip replacement? Personally or for the patient? Um, <laughs> I. So racket sports in general, so things like tennis, uh, squash, even badminton to a degree, they tend to just be the perfect storm really when it comes to joint replacement surgery. Uh, the combination of rapid acceleration, rapid deceleration and rapid changes of direction as well, mm -hmm. um, tend not to mix very well with, with, with joint replacement surgery. Um, so generally patients, um, if you are able to still play squash or tennis, um, then I would possibly suggest that it, the time is not right for a, a hip or knee replacement. If you are unable to play because of your hip or knee, then although you may get back to playing um, at a, a low level or more stationary, uh, I wouldn't expect you to get back to, to competitive levels. Um, you just have to look at Andy Murray. Um, who is surrounded by a team of people whose only job is to get him on the tennis court. And he has not been the same since a hip replacement. He's not reached that same level. Um, so although it is technically possible, I think you'll struggle to reach the levels that you were at at your prime. I agree with that. But the caveat is a couple of years ago, I had a, a man in his 50s that came to see me with a very arthritic knee. 
and he was the squash coach at a local private school. And he laid on my desk a magazine, I think it was called Squash Weekly or Squash Monthly. And he opened it up in the centre pages and there was a spread about a 70 year old man who had both of his knees replaced and he is the world veteran champion. And he said, can, can I have one of these, please? <laughs> I, was, I, I had the perfect storm moment like Alex has just mentioned, but I thought, well, yeah, why not? You know, this guy in the magazine has obviously managed to get back to a reasonable level. So we went for it. And as far as I'm aware, he's back coaching squash and still playing uh, competitive squash. But he understands, just like Alex has mentioned, that it, it won't be quite the same. So you can certainly get back to playing those things if you're just aware that your knee may wear out a bit sooner. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, our next question is from Paul. If someone is classed as obese, would this mean that they could not have a knee replacement? No, but uh, if you want to have your knee replacement at Benenden, the, the BMI cutoff is a, a BMI of 40. So um, uh, elsewhere, there are different uh, criteria. But uh, the higher that your BMI is, there are perceived increased surgical risks. But certainly, I think up to about BMI of 45, uh, a knee replacement probably uh, can be safely performed. Uh, I think 50 and above, I have, I have some um, uh, res reservations about that. I don't know what you feel about that, Alex. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's down to uh, patient safety factors. Once your BMI is over 40, the risk of developing a complication is significantly higher. Uh, so uh, you will find that private hospitals or, or, or standalone units that don't have on-site access to uh, critical care, high dependency units, they will be more selective about uh, BMI when it comes to surgery. And uh, you, you know, you'll find that at Benenden. If your BMI is over 40, then uh, you, you wouldn't be accepted at Benenden, whereas you would at a local NHS hospital that has all that critical care facilities in place just if it's needed. I certainly have a, a large cohort of patients who have a BMI between 40 and 50 who are delighted with their hip and knee replacements. Um, you know, it is, it, it, it's a good operation for people of all sizes, but it has to be performed safely in the correct environment for them. Great, thank you. Right, and um, that's all the questions we actually have time for today, because um, we have um, just the hitch of our time. Um, so I just want to say thank you both for your presentation. It's been really interesting. Um, and if anyone would like to book an initial consultation, our um, friendly private patient advisor, um, Lindsay, is available until 9pm this evening on this number on your screen. Um, at the end of this presentation, you'll receive a short survey. And I'd be really grateful if you could spare a few minutes to let us have your feedback on today's webinar. Um, and our next webinar is on Saturday, the 5th of June, with Mr Gupta and our own Jan Chasley on continence care. If you um, know or you're interested in that, then please put that in your diary and you can um, register online or via our website. Um, so on behalf of Mr. Chipperfield and Mr. Oliver, myself and the team at Benton Hospital, I'd like to say thank you very much for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you again soon. So thank you very thank much you. and good luck. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.